Um, this is lecture 10 on the Risha and Kokoron to secure the peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth, Risha and Kokoron. So, uh, believe it or not, we've been following this series of lectures now for almost two years, once every two months. And the next lecture will be the last one. Uh, so it will be just about two years since we began them. And it's amazing that this great work uh, should have filled us with interest, which I really think it has, uh, from beginning to end. Uh, today, we're going to deal uh, with question number eight of the questions posed by the guest to his host for the night. Uh, also, the answer to that question. And then we'll deal with question number nine. And the remainder of the Gosha will be dealt with then in the next lecture. So question number eight, uh, those of you who have the Seiko Times uh, reproduction, is on page 28, right-hand column. Page 28, right-hand column. So as usual, uh, to summarize just a little what went on in the last lecture, which was based, of course, on answer number seven, uh, given by the host, who, you remember, is Nichiren Daishonin, to his guest, who represented the most powerful man in Japan at that time. And the Risho Ankokoron was set out as a dialogue of question and answer uh, in order to shakabuku this man. And he sent, uh, Nichiren Daishonin sent this Gosho in the form of a dialogue, exactly as we're reading it here, to uh, Hojo Tokuyori, this most powerful man behind the scenes, in the hope that he could at last shakabuku him. Sadly, uh, he didn't succeed. But he gave us a document as a result of this, which is as relevant to the situation in the world today as it was in those medieval times in Japan. And the answer which we last dealt with, number seven, concerned the matter of how to deal with slanderers of the true law. This is the crux of this Gosho, because Nichiren Daishonin is pointing out that the uh, terrible confusion and chaos, the outbreaks of epidemics, famine, and all the other natural disasters which were occurring in J Japan were because people were slandering the true law. That is to say, slandering life. So in that last answer that we studied in the last lecture, you remember probably that the language which was used in the sutras, which were quoted by Nishin Daishonin, was incredibly strong. And for a moment, maybe it quite shocked and startled us. For example, Nichiren Daishonin used the following quotation from the Nirvana Sutra. Men of devout faith, at that time I cherished the Mahayana teachings in my heart. Once when I heard Brahmins slandering these same teachings, I had them put to death on the spot. And again another quotation he used from the Nirvana Sutra. Men of devout faith, Defenders of the true law should carry knives and swords, bows and arrows, prongs and lances. Even though they carry knives and staves, I would call them men who observe the precepts. So on the face of it, one could get totally the wrong idea, the wrong meaning from such quotation. And of course, one of the purposes of this Gosho is to explain the true meaning of this. And as we went along with our study, we began to understand that this very strong language, using such words as killing, slanderers, and so on, was to instill in us uh, the terrible cause that is made by slandering the law or slandering life, and the terrible effects that can result from it. And the vigor, therefore, with which we should refute and condemn 
the statements of slanderers. So this is the purest jihi or Buddhist mercy. If one allows a person freely to slander the law, to slander the life, saying nothing, even though we know the truth of the cause and effect of such an action, then we have no jihi, we have no Buddhist mercy. So we should refute and condemn such statements because in doing so we may be able to help those people to see the truth and save themselves from incredible sufferings through the workings of the law of cause and effect. So to slander life, Buddhism teaches, is the most dreadful cause you can possibly make. And anyone who does so will inevitably reap retribution and suffer uh, for a long, long time. So all through this series of lectures, I believe there has been a growing realization in our lives about uh, this matter of slander and how fearful it is and how it can be done almost without thinking through ignorance of the true law and that it can be the downfall of a whole nation or even of the entire human family as well as causing the downfall of any one individual. So we realized that the sufferings of the world at this present time and no one could deny that there isn't incredible suffering almost everywhere one looks are due to slander ignoring or despising the dignity of life which unfailingly through cause and effect will bring fearful retribution so recently we've suffered retribution from past slander in the form for example of the Falkland Islands dispute however much one may admire the courage of the young men who went out there to fight however much one perhaps could admire from the military standpoint the use of minimum force by our fighting services once again as a nation we have killed and maimed and caused misery and bereavement. The use of brute force in whatever form, taking life, slandering life in the worst possible way is no solution to anything. And furthermore, we are making the causes to perpetuate that karma. Once more we've done it. Once more we must receive retribution. We're making the causes for it to happen all over again. This is the Buddhist view of the crisis which this country has just been through. So of course this is part of our national karma. And the cause of it is not just that 150 years ago uh, we decided to occupy some deserted islands uh, which were only 200 miles or so off the coast of the Argentine, 8,000 miles away from Britain. But the cause of what we are suffering now lies also, of course, in our colonial history when we seized territory and we slaughtered in the process. Of course, we can say those times were different. Life was cheap then. And of course our colonial history wasn't all bad. We also did many great things. But this cannot undo the greatest of all slanders, which is to kill life. This is the irrefutable Buddhist teaching. And in the light of cause and effect, how could anyone really deny that this must be so? So ignorance of this fact, however, 
is evident everywhere. People turn a blind eye in some way from it. And just as much here in this country as everywhere else in the world. It became manifest, I think, last Monday in the confusion in people's minds over what was called the Falklands service which was held at St. Paul's Cathedral. No one seemed to know whether it was a memorial service or whether it was a victory thanksgiving or whether it was a thanksgiving for deliverance from the further pains of war. No one understood. No one was quite sure. Perhaps this is evidence of the ignorance and weakness of the religious teachings uh, that have existed up to this time. So, going back to these sutras that Nichiren Daishonin quotes, the brutal words that are used are to emphasize the gravity of slander, which is destroying or hurting life, whether physically, spiritually, or mentally, by thought, by word, or by deed. So, as our study of the Risho Ankokuron has proceeded, we've realized, I think now, that the words to kill a slanderer in the sutras means to wipe out slander from that person's mind, to kill their evil mind, and to stop them, of course, from destroying others in the process, as well as destroying themselves. Likewise, in the passage I read out, for instance, to carry prongs and lances and bows and arrows and swords and staves and all that means to be ready to reprimand slanderers and to refute what they're saying at any time in order to try to correct the error of their thoughts with words that indeed sometimes may have to be like a stab in the heart to them. So it's the words that are the stab in the heart. And even those words need not be angrily said. But when ignorance is suddenly changed to a more enlightened understanding, it can be like a stab in the heart to the person when they reflect on all that they've believed in and all the mistakes they've made in the past. Can't it? So in the Gosho Admonitions Against Slander, Nichiren Daishonin said this, in the Nirvana Sutra, Shakyamuni stated, if even a good priest sees someone slandering the law and disregards him, failing to reproach him, to oust him, or to punish him for his offense, then that priest is betraying Buddhism. But if he takes the slanderer severely to task, drives him off or punishes him, then he is my disciple and one who truly understands my teachings. And then Nichiren Daishonin says, never forget this admonition against ignoring another slander of Buddhism. Both master and disciple will surely fall into the hell of incessant suffering if they see enemies of the Lotus Sutra and fail to reproach them. So to reprimand or refute a slander is an utmost act of jihi, mercy, to try to save their lives from the severe retribution which will inevitably follow. And of course, also, it leads other people's thoughts astray and away from the truth about life. This is why to reprimand or refute a slanderer is so important. Even though slander of life arises out of ignorance, it still remains the worst sin which reaps the worst retribution. So we really need to remember this, each one of us. Perhaps one day we may find ourselves talking to someone who believes in war, who believes in punishing uh, people of other nations by force, or who's in favor of killing 
or destroying life in one way or another. And we must courageously refute those ideas. Otherwise, we are no better than slanderers ourselves, are we? in accordance with the law of cause and effect, which is so strict. Now recently, in uh, Nagasaki, when I was there, Sensei gave three points about uh, war and the situations arising from war. Firstly, he said, we should never agree with the use of force and always be prepared to voice our views and our reasons. Secondly, we should of course chant that attempts to use force should be stopped or if it is being used that it should cease. And in this way we can change or begin to change our national karma. And third point he said was, however, we are not politicians and cannot order a ceasefire. The best action, therefore, from the point of view of the future, is to determine to support the United Nations and take the initiative in encouraging a great movement of ordinary human beings to ensure that in the future the United Nations operates within its charter, which is uh, of the highest and most noble form. And then he said, if anyone disagrees with this, please come forward with a better solution for the future. So now, after that little introduction, just to get all our minds back to where they were several months ago, I'll ask John to read question eight. The guest said, if we are to put an end to these people who slander the law, and do away with those who violate the prohibitions of the Buddha, then are we to condemn them to death as described in the passages from the sutras you have just cited? If we do that, then we ourselves will be guilty of inflicting injury and death upon others and will suffer the consequences, will we not? In the Daijuku Sutra, the Buddha says, if a person shaves his head and puts on clerical robes, then whether that person observes the precepts or violates them, both gods and men should give him alms. In doing so, they are giving alms and support to me, for that person is my son. But if men beat and abuse that person, they are beating my son, and if they curse and insult him, they are reviling me. If we stop to consider, we must realize that Regardless of whether the person is good or bad, right or wrong, if he is a priest or monk, then he deserves to have alms and nourishment extended to him. For how could one beat and insult the son and still not cause grief and sorrow to the father? The Brahmins who beat the Buddha's disciple, the Buddha's disciple Maud Galyayana to death with their staves have for a long time been sunk in the hell of incessant suffering. Because Devadatta murdered the nun Atpalavarana, he has gone on and on choking in the flames of the Avicii hell. Examples from earlier ages make the matter perfectly clear, and later ages fear this offense most of all. You speak of punishing those who slander the law, but to do so, would violate the Buddha's prohibition. I can hardly believe that such a course would be right. How can you justify it? So Nichiren Daishonin's purpose in posing this question as made by the guest to his host is to clear up confusion over this point of how, what practical steps to take to stop the slander which was rife in the land of Japan at that time. And of course is rife indeed uh, throughout the world today. Now the only effective way which he leads into is Shakabuku. Even a person who is thoroughly evil must be saved. 
This would be the Buddhist teaching. Therefore, we have to establish a relationship between all people and the Gonsan, or do our best to do so. And in this respect, even what is known as a reverse relationship with the Gonsan will end in that person embracing it. The important thing is the relationship. You may remember I explained this in the last lecture, but to remind you once again, it's best to mention the story of King Ajatashatru, who uh, refused to listen to the teachings of the Buddha, largely because of the machinations of that evil cousin of Shakyamuni's, Devadatta. Although uh, King Bimbashara, who was Ajatashatru's father, was Shakyamuni's sponsor. Nevertheless, the son, Ajatashatru, wouldn't listen. And for a long time, he led a wild and evil life, uh, killing one of his parents and constantly waging war on his neighbors and slaughtering vast numbers of people in the process. But in the end, uh, he came out in fearful, stinking boils, as they're described. And as a result of that, it brought him up short in his tracks. It caused him to stop and reflect. And through that reflection, he began to realize that this must be cause and effect, the result of his past evil deeds and actions. And therefore, he went to Shakyamuni Buddha and began to accept the teachings of Buddhism. And, as the story ends, extended his life by 40 years. So this began with a reverse relationship with the Buddha. He slandered Shakyamuni, largely due uh, to being incited by Devadatta. But in the end, that relationship was the important thing, because when he did come up against it, it caused him to stop, think, reflect on his life, and then realize that he must do something about it to save himself from hell and he embraced the teachings. So we no need to fear when we're doing shakabuka. This is why Sensei said, whether or not people listen to what you say, we should talk about Buddhism. The most important thing is the establishment of the relationship between a person and the Gohonzi. Even if at the beginning uh, it's a relationship which is slanderous. That slander is in that person's life anyway. It has to come out before they can find true happiness. So in the end, our responsibility is, isn't it, to kill the evil mind of the slanderer. So of course we don't have the right to kill anybody physically for the sake of Buddhism. Sensei once said that you could say life was like a crystal. It turns the color of whatever color light is shone onto it. If you shine a blue light onto a crystal, the crystal appears to be blue. If you shine a red light onto a crystal, it appears to be red. So to kill somebody is like destroying the crystal itself. Whereas what is needed is to shine the right color light onto the crystal. So all human life, whatever the behavior of that individual person, is treasure in the eyes of Buddhism and all the Buddhist teachings. So we tend, of course, to condemn people. We condemn a race, a type of people, a category of people. This is the awful human tendency arising from the lower world. Whereas, in fact, of course, it's the color of the light that may be causing them to behave in an ignorant or unpleasant way. So, we must be absolutely clear that in Buddhism we are totally against harm or hurt or killing of life and we are totally against slander of life. This is the enemy, if you like, the evil force in life, 
which we have to do battle with and should do battle with every day both in ourselves and where necessary when we see it working in other people. So in this respect, as an example, it's great that this nation has ceased to use capital punishment. Whatever the arguments to and from, capital punishment is destroying life. And life is the most precious treasure. Going back to this question, uh, John, can you just read again from in the Daijoku Sutra? In the Daijoku Sutra, the Buddha says, if a person shaves his head and puts on clerical robes, then whether that person observes the precepts or violates them, both gods and men should give him alms. In doing so, they are giving alms and support to me for that person is my son. But if men beat and abuse that person, they are beating my son. And if they curse and insult him, they are reviling me. Thank you. This all sounds a bit confuse, confusing in the light of what we've already been considering. And of course this is why Nishin Daishonin included this particular uh, paragraph in the Risho Ankokoron. So, instead of uh, thinking about priests, Let's think about one of our great cathedrals. This is very much in my mind because just a few days ago we took the two priests uh, to York uh, before proceeding to Harrogate to do the Gojikai ceremony and whilst in York uh, they were very anxious to look at York Minster. So um, maybe some of you, many of you have seen it but it's one of the greatest cathedrals of this country. So York Minster is a fantastic and beautiful building. It's full of marvelous examples of craftsmanship, isn't it? And human skills. Uh, inside there are priceless carvings, uh, stained glass windows which are famous throughout the world, works of art, and priceless uh, gold and silverware and other treasures. So because of this beauty, people tend to honor and respect a religion. People go to temples in Buddhist countries, and if they're magnificent, they're overawed by it, and feel, oh, this must be something great. But of course this is in fact absurd. If the teachings of the religion are weak or ignorant, no matter how beautiful the building, uh, they're going to be of no ultimate value to this world or to the people concerned. So we can respect, of course, history and artistry, craftsmanship contained in the cathedral, but not the teachings that it represents. We can apply the same, perhaps, uh, to the Pope who has recently visited this country. I believe he's a compassionate and courageous man. This of course we must respect. But this doesn't mean to say that we should respect what he preaches. For example, in one of his statements he said the great evils of the world are threefold. Abortion, contraception, and divorce. This is quite shallow. And for many, very controversial. Mm -hmm. Buddhism teaches that these three things, contraception, abortion, and divorce, are only evil if they are motivated by the three poisons of greed, Anger, anger and ignorance and that to make a general rule for all humanity can be cruel and destructive and destroy people's happiness. So going back to the Daijuku Sutra which is quoted here because a person dresses in the traditional robes of a priest 
doesn't mean to say uh, that what he thinks, says and does is necessarily respectworthy. We can respect his intentions but not what he teaches. And if it is slander, we have to try to change his mind. Whilst I was with the two priests, Reverend Maikawa and Reverend Seiki, I was so moved by their absolute determination to make us understand that they too are common mortals, just like us, in every way equal to us. Just a difference in role and purpose or mission. They were relaxed, frank, open. They were very joyful company and we became great friends, all of us. So even the robes of a Nichiren Shoshu priest are symbolic of this, this equality with the lay people. For the first time, uh, one of the priests showed that the robes carry a number of square patches. This is to remind them and is symbolic of the fact that at one time the priests of Nichiren Shoshu were incredibly poor and that they are ordinary people who suffer uh, the ups and downs of this life as much as anyone else does. And they share sufferings of the people of this world on an absolutely equal level in relation to the Gonsen. And I think this is a very wonderful thing. There's a story that after World War II, when the head temple was in great disrepair, as you know, the lay people donated all the money they could for the temple to be made reason in a reasonable condition once again. And as you may know, there are two main sects of lay people, uh, sorry, main uh, lay societies. One is the Sokogakai, and the other is called the Hokeiko sect. In fact, today, uh, uh, President Ikeda is president of both those lay societies. And the Hokeiko sect at that time asked the priests to account for the way they spent this money. Mr. Toad disagreed. He said we should donate freely. It's up to the priests how to use it. We should respect their right to do so. In other words, a person who teaches the true law is respectworthy and we must treat him as such. Another term used in this quotation from the Risho Ankokoron is the children of the Buddha, the term the children of the Buddha. He says, in doing so they are giving alms and support to me for that person is my son. This is Shakyamuni's talking in the Daijuku Sutra. Sometimes we're also told, aren't we, that we're children of the Buddha. So what is a child of the Buddha? Uh, 26 high priest Nikkan said, a child of the Buddha is a person who practices Yumyo Shojin. So in the Hoben Pond of Gongyo, in the Hoben chapter, we say many times every day, Jingyo Shobutsu Muryo Doho Yumyo Shojin Myo Sho Fumon, right? Yumyo Shojin. Yumyo means valiantly. Shojin means untiringly, seeking the Buddha. So 26 high priests said, Yumyo means therefore steadfast faith in the Gohonzu. And Shojin means chanting Daimoku untiringly. Mr. Makiguchi uh, used to say, Dr. Yamazaki just quoted this the other day, to take faith in the Gohonzon and do nothing is evil. To take faith and take action is good. Using those terms of evil and good uh, in respect of the evil force of life or the negative force of life and the positive force of life. To take faith in the Gohonzon and do nothing is evil. 
To take faith and take action is good. Nothing meaning taking no action for one's own human revolution or to change society in this world for the better. So I'm sure all members of the Gaka really are living up or doing their best to live up to this term, Yumyo Shoju. I'm sure all of us here today are. Trying to advance a little bit every day. In the answer that follows this particular question, Nidran Daishonin explains further that censure of a person's slandering is not against the person of the priest. It is against what he is teaching. Slander of the true law of life. So, of course, in this respect, they are not children of the Buddha if the words that are emitted from their mouths are not the words of the Buddha. So we'll go on and deal with that in a moment and we'll have a little break now for about seven minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, can we settle down, please? Very much. Uh, we'll start now with answer eight. That's at the top of page 29, uh, and John will just read it out to you. <coughs> the host said, You have clearly seen the passages from the sutras that I have cited, and yet you can ask a question like that. Are they beyond the power of your mind to comprehend, or do you fail to understand the reasoning behind them? I certainly, certainly have no intention of censuring the sons of the Buddha. My only hatred is for the act of slandering the law. According to the teachings of the Buddhas who lived prior to Shakyamuni, slanderous priests would have incurred the death penalty. But in the sutras preached since the time of Shakyamuni, priests of this type have merely been prevented from receiving alms. Now if the people within the four seas and the 10,000 lands, all those who belong to the four kinds of believers, if only they would cease giving alms to wicked priests and instead would allow all come, and instead would all come over to the side of the good, then how could we have any more of these troubles rising to plague us, these disasters coming to confront us? Thank you. This is really a crucial point because Nishin Daishonin is pointing out uh, to the ruling authorities of those times that they were still supporting priests who were spreading teachings that were evil and could lead people to unhappiness. In other words, the ruling authorities were revering perhaps tradition and history and the beauty and treasures of the great temples in Japan at that time but they were not examining the teachings themselves. And then he goes on to point out that before Shakyamuni's day, before Buddhism, uh, evil priests were actually killed physically. We know this because there are many stories in Shakyamuni's Buddhism uh, where he gives examples of people suffering intensely because of killing a priest in the past. But from Shakyamuni's time onwards, from the time of the inception of Buddhism onwards, if an evil priest did not respond to Shakabuku in the true teachings, then offerings to him were stopped. In other words, the treasures of life were denied to him. The treasures uh, that provide accommodation, clothing and food. And as a result of that, of course, their influence was reduced and ultimately destroyed. So it was killing the evil in them, causing them to reflect. At that point, I'd just like now with you to look at the true meaning of the word shakubuku, which we use so often. So shaku means to break or refute. To break or refute. 
or instead of break you could say sever or cut, cut off. And buku means to cause to follow. Shaku, to break or cut and refute. Buku, to cause to follow. This means, in other words, to kill a slanderous mind. Kill in inverted commas. And to stop offerings, the source of life. So it's like, in a way, cutting off with a sword. So slander, as we well now know, is acting against the true law. That is to say, acting against life. Distorting, in other words, or going against the true teachings of the Buddha, which all concern, are all concerned with the dignity of life. So you can see that we use shakabuku in the UK in a quite a loose way. I guess it's such a fascinating word to use. But strictly speaking, shakabuku is only necessary in a Buddhist country where people have a strong attachment over generations in families to teachings which are slanderous and distorted or to formalities and rituals which are equally slanderous practiced, of course, however, in the name of Buddhism. Doing these things because their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers and their fathers and their mothers and grandmothers did it. Clinging to things superstitiously or sentimentally for fear of offending their relatives or their ancestors fear of demons and devils and all the other ways in which uh, such distorted teachings which were far from the truth had to resort to in order to hold the people. So in the Gosho it clearly explains, as most of you know, that in a non-Buddhist country where there is no deliberate distortion we use what is called shoju. Shoju is as different, as Nichiren Daishonin said, from Shakabuku, as fire is from water. So, shoju means by persuasion, by discussion, and by example. Shoju means that we understand and can relate to the erroneous thoughts of the person whom we're talking to that we do not necessarily categorically say they are wrong but we draw them gradually to understand the truth through those three means of persuasion, discussion and example. So of course uh, of those three example is by far the most convincing isn't it? It's the way we change that convinces parents, brothers, sisters, friends, people in the office and so on to practice. Because it's proof of the power of the Gohonsun. And it's the power of the Gohonsun which is most important that we should talk about. The actual proof, the experiences of that power. Nijin Daijan himself said that the three proofs were all important, of course, literary, theoretical, and actual. But by far the most important is actual, because they actually show in this daily life the infinite power of the Gohonsun at work. And this is something which other religions can't necessarily show. And this is the best way to cause people to begin to practice. On the 6th of June, we celebrated Europe Day. And uh, at that time, Sensei sent us a message. And I just want to read a bit of it to you, if I can find it. Our faith and practice are quite naturally manifested in our daily lives. On the other hand, our contemporary society has lost its correct view of life and humankind's place in it. In such circumstances, it is an inevitable tendency for people 
to seek out true Buddhism, which reveals the absolute law, which is neither a partial view nor just an ideology, but provides people with the means to actually transform the reality of their lives. Therefore, by awakening yourselves to your profound mission and establishing roots in society based on the principle that faith and practice are equal, faith and practice equal daily life, I ask each one of you to be respected citizens who steadily and untiringly make a valuable contribution to your community and to society in general. If you want to look that up again, it's in July's UK Express. In other words, what we achieve in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, is the actual proof which many people, though they know it not in their conscious minds, are waiting for.